Schwartz uh, here to discuss criminal defense attorney and former public defender in Dearborn, Michigan, Michael Jaffer, and uh, uh, Dante Porter. He, a pointer is in Sacramento, where the Kings are up to nothing on the Warriors. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, Michael, to you first. The um, the financial aspect of all of this. How important is it for the state to also add that into the mix? Because that is a different kind of motivation, not just religious fervor that could have led to the, these deaths. It's massively important because when you're a prosecutor, you have to establish motive. If you don't establish motive, you are very, very handcuffed in your prosecution. So the the, the financial motive serves as a motive. It's a very important one. Uh, in their opening statement, they made they made a comment that this is about money, sex, and power. Right. Well, so they they have to establish all these things, otherwise they will lose credibility points with the with the with the jury. Right. So if they're going to tell the, the the jury, this was among other things about money as well well they have to establish what they mean by it was about money so they are establishing motive and they are also fulfilling a promise they made to the jury in their opening statement so this is very very important dante how are they doing with it as matt said it is a bit convoluted because you have these social security payments that were coming into jj and tylee which Lori was living off of um, but you know to me they're better off alive than if you're living off that money that they're getting because of the deaths of their their fathers um but to you know there's the life insurance and there's the rest of it it's a, it's a tangled um type of story it's not as easy to follow believe it or not as the 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 uh religious craziness um michael how would you defend Lori vallo daybell it would be very difficult it would be very difficult and i'll tell you why my co uh, co panels just mentioned the testimony from the sun when your own son is testifying uh, and there's recorded calls uh, of him telling you, you know, you murdered my siblings, you lied to me. Um, that's going to be very difficult. If I had to defend Lori D D Daybell, I would do it exactly the way her defense attorneys are doing it right now. In his opening statement, he said, "Look, when the when the children died, they died in the apartment of Alex uh, of Alex Cox when uh, e. Lori was, you know, thousands of miles away in her apartment." So I would defend her by saying, "Look, there are other people. You're not going to be able to say no one did anything wrong." Right. And so my job as her defense attorney is to defend her and only her and not to defend the events or to defend the murders, to only defend her and her culpability. It would be a challenge, but that's what I would do. And that's what they're doing. She looks like she's staring at it right now, unless something changes here uh, as this trial continues. Coming up, we're going to turn our attention to Colorado and the stepmother murder trial for Letitia Stout. The jury is hearing more of these recorded conversations between the defendant and her husband while they were looking for little Gannon. Uh, he's trying to get answers. The FBI is right next to him, feeding him questions, and she is stonewalling them. Michael Jaffer and Dante Pointer are still with us. She has pled not guilty by reason of insanity. Michael, anything in there you hear that the defense can use um, to their benefit? That conversation was very bizarre. Look, people don't understand how difficult an insanity defense is. I had a, a client who was facing attempted murder. We pled the insanity defense. This client had a long history of mental health issues, medication, in, inpatient, right? And what you understand is that the state of the law in our country is very against people leveling an insanity defense. And her defense counsel aren't even leveling an insanity defense. They're saying it was temporary insanity which is even more difficult, right? Because you have to convince a jury, first, that insanity even applies, and second, that she had a temporary moment of insanity. I... I this... I wasn't in the room when they had this... Con when they had their initial conferences with her, but it must have been an overwhelming amount of evidence against her where her attorney would have looked at her as a defense attorney it's the worst thing to tell a client we're not winning this case you're going to be in jail for the rest of your life the only question is do you want to be in jail or do you want to be in a mental hospital for the rest of your life because even if they're successful it's not like she's going to walk out of the courtroom she's going to be in hospitals for the rest of her life and then she's going to go to jail so that conversation was bizarre as a defense attorney I don't I mean it doesn't it doesn't sway one way or the other it shows that she's narcissistic uh, and she's worrying about a diamond ring when a kid is missing
mm -hmm. right? So that doesn't rise to the level of insanity, but that does show you as being a narcissist. That Absolutely. doesn't help. Yeah, and there, there's never a like shared feeling, oh gosh, you know, Gannon's gone, Gannon's gone, Gannon. Just, you know, if you think about an 11 year old missing, that's where every conversation would be until the 11 year old was yeah. found with everybody, not, <laughs> but definitely your wife, the woman who was last seen with him. All right, let's get a break, then we'll get you back in the courtroom for more of this conversation between Al Stauk and his wife at the time, Letitia. Here to discuss criminal defense attorney and former public defender, Michael Jafar, uh, Jafer, and he's in Dearborn, Michigan. In Michael Jafer, the idea that Chad Daybell's property is being searched, we've heard that phone call with him and Lori, she's in, incarcerated at the time, and he's announcing that the authorities are there searching, and while they're searching, he is transferring $8,000 to each of his kids, basically liquidating his account. That to me is huge uh, because that means he knows they're gonna find those bodies on his property, but that's Chad. This is Lori's trial. How, um, is this an opportunity, it hasn't happened yet, is this an opportunity on cross for Lori's defense team to really hone in on that and um, remind the jury that Chad is the one that um, is, pro you know, maybe in charge here, and he's the one that did all this. Yes, it absolutely is an opportunity. Here's the thing: when the when the prosecutors in their opening statement made a promise to the to the jury that we're going to prove to you that this is about money, among other things. I really hope that they have more evidence and more compelling evidence than what they've presented right now. Because if all they can show is that her husband, who's not on trial, was transferring $8,000 and she had Social Security that actually went away by her kids dying, uh, then they don't have a, 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 ba a basis there. This, th this is crazy because what you would expect to see, if, if a prosecutor promises you, I'm going to show you that this is about money, you want to see seven figures. Right. If you're a jury and, and this is a, a crime of passion, like we're talking about the murdering of children. We're not talking about, you know, getting into a car accident for 100 grand. We're talking about the murder of your own children. So so if they're going to try to prove to the jury that her husband transferred money and he knew that they were going to lose if they if he didn't transfer the money, they're going to find the kids. This becomes very convoluted. I was one of the people that watched the opening statements and I said, wow, I, I want to see. They're, they're promising that this is about money, sex, and power. What about the money? Because that would be big. We're talking, as a matter of fact, it turns out now that she lost money by her kids dying, right? So this is going to be embarrassing. If I'm her defense attorney, I'm salivating at the cross-examination. My line of questioning is simple. You said this is about money, but by her kids dying, she lost the Social Security. So what financial gain did she get by her kids dying? And I would just stop there. And Michael, the hatred for Lori um, is probably palpable in that courtroom from jurors. When you listen to her son get up on the stand and listen to those phone calls of where are the kids and you lied to me and you've killed these, um, even if she wasn't there, and there isn't a direct email, kill the kids, or um, you know, unless Chad Daybell comes in here and tells this jury she was in charge and told me to do it, um, is there enough just from that hatred that a, she's a horrible mom? I mean, and, and, and if, especially if there are, are mothers and, or, and fathers, but really a mother's on this jury, that, it's just the whole thing doesn't make any sense. Your kids are missing and yes. your kids are dead and you're just sitting there laughing when your son calls you when you're in prison and ha <laughs> um, Isn't that enough to there, Matt, there, Dante's point? I mean, this to, to get a conviction? There are thousands of people in jail for the rest of their lives who never lifted a finger to murder a single person. Look at Charles Manson, right? Never killed anybody, but he's in jail for the rest of his life. He'll, he'll serve 10,000 years if he's alive, right? They don't have to prove that she murdered her kids physically for her to be convicted of something. They're called inchoate crimes, right? So she will, if they can prove that she had a hand, metaphorically a hand in the murder of her kids, she's going to jail for the rest of her life. Here's what's apparent now, what's already apparent to any juror, in my opinion. Lori Daybell, she's a villain. That's not a legal analysis. That's just a human analysis. She's a villain, for sure.
right? And when you listen to the recordings of her conversations with her son when she's in jail, even her son thinks she's a villain. Even her son is accusing her of killing his siblings, right? So the financial motive, in my opinion, it, it, it harms the prosecution, right? But you're looking at this lady's picture. She's smiling. Her kids were killed, right? Like, I don't like, even if my kids were sick, you know, I'm, I can't, I can't mm -hmm. go to sleep at night, right? This lady's clearly a villain. So we're going to see the rest of the balance of this case pre present itself. But uh, they don't have, to, they, they have enough in order to convince the jury now that she's a villain, what the jury does in closed quarters, the analysis they make, if they believe that every single element of the crime was proven beyond a reasonable doubt, that's to be seen. There's a lot of case to be heard, um, but they don't have to prove that she actually physically killed her kids for her to spend the rest of her life in prison. Yeah, it seems like a long stretch to go from villain to victim, but we'll see. Uh, Michael Jaffer and Adante Pointer are still with us. And that's that's the point, right, Michael? That uh, in, you, as you said, you've defended um, a, a client trying to go this route of insanity, and, and hers is a higher bar because it's this temporary insanity. Well, now, here she is using every bit of her intelligence trying to deflect every one of these questions and running, and, and uh, I, it's, it's tough. Uh, do you agree with uh, Dante that uh, this goes to that she's not insane because she's able to pull, you know, she's able to keep this guy on the phone for hours and, and not answer yeah. questions? Yeah, because they're not even alleging insanity, they're alleging temporary insanity. So it's not temporary if, uh, you know, weeks after the case, she's spending hours and hours on the phone justifying uh, not even what she did, but uh, explaining away that it's somebody else's fault. It's always your fault. It's always that person's fault. It's not my fault, right? Um, narcissism is not insanity, right? Being a villain is not insanity. Being a, look, There's a lot of people in jail right now and Dante will, will, will agree, that have murdered people, almost not a single one of these people are, are, are a normal, rational person that you can have a conversation with, have dinner with, right? So if somebody just being a little bit off is enough for you to get a temporary insanity defense, there would be nobody in jail, right? There would be white-collar criminals in jail. That's it, right? There would be nobody in jail for literally stabbing a kid. You know, this is like the most heinous thing you could do. It's not, you can't get worse. She didn't push the kid off a cliff. She didn't shoot the kid. She didn't get into a car. She actually took a knife and she got up close. She did something that's so horrendous, so heinous, that it's one thing if she would have done it and then she would have went to the hospital, went to the police, said, I, I don't know what happened. Uh, I think I was involved in a, in a murder, I think, but uh, let me lead you to the scene. I have no idea if it was me or somebody else. It still would have been difficult. It still would have been nearly impossible. But she would have had a, a some sort of, her attorneys at least would have had some argument that, look, she reported herself. She was contrite. She, 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 she tried to understand what happened. She still doesn't know what happened. But that's not what these calls show. These calls show the opposite. This woman's going to jail for the rest of her life she, with no, uh, no opportunity of parole. Mm -hmm. Stabbed him 18 times and uh, hit him uh, several times with one object. It's just horrible. The worst of the worst, as you the say. The worst thing you could do. Yep. All right.